Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me the honor of being able to share today's message with you. When I was first asked if I'd be willing to give this year's message, I was honored, but also surprised. As many of you remember, I was once a member of this church when I was a young child, about 30 years ago. My dad, the Reverend Thomas R. Edmonds, served as your pastor from April 1993 to around April 1995. Though his time as your pastor was brief and much shorter than we had hoped, our history with this church has spanned three decades. Life with a PK, or preacher's kid, has been a unique experience. I've probably had the Lord's Prayer and Apostles' Creed memorized since I was four years old. I've seen the good and bad, yes, I said bad, in many churches over the years. Life with a PK can go one of two ways. Either the person embraces their role and chooses to follow Jesus, or they try to run as far away from the church as possible. Luckily, I have chosen the former rather than the latter as much as possible in my 36 years on this earth. But that decision has not always come easily. As I said earlier, my dad served as your pastor from April 1993 to April 1995. This time, although short, still holds many, many memories for me, even though I was only about six years old when our time here at Salem was complete. In the two years that my dad served this church, we experienced the vast differences in weather, where we went from having so much snow the one winter that almost every Lenten service was canceled, to having what seemed like the hottest summer on record at the time, with only window units and box fans to keep us cool in the parsonage. I also have fond memories of my parents singing in the church choir, especially in the Christmas and Easter cantatas. And I remember spending many Sundays sitting next to the people that my sister and I fondly refer to as our adopted grandparents. Anna Hoover, Ken and Marie Cocker, and Leon and Ethel Buffington. They were always there with a smile and some kind of candy for us as we sat by them while our parents sang in the choir and my dad gave the weekly sermon. Their kindness is something that has stuck with me for years and for that I am forever grateful. After our time at Salem came to an end, my dad's career path took a detour which lasted about until my last year of high school. He spent over a decade in the secular work world as a life insurance agent, while only filling in for Sunday supply for pastors in the area when they were sick or on vacation. However, he was finally called back to the ministry on a more permanent basis in June 2006, when he was called to serve as an interim pastor at St. Paul's UCC until Pastor Ray became their permanent pastor in January 2007. From here, my dad served several churches as their interim pastor in places like Fort Loudoun, McConnellsburg, Newport, Ashland, Urban, and Tremont. All these experiences were unique and different, all helped to further shape his ministry and serve the church. My dad's journey in ministry had its challenges along the way, but I'm so grateful that my dad is still doing the thing he loved doing, what he felt called to do, until his sudden death in 2018. When my dad died in 2018, our family understandably felt lost, both emotionally, personally, and spiritually. The two weeks between the day that my dad died and his memorial service are honestly a blur. The reality of the minute my dad's memorial service was over and the ensuing rain that continued for the next few weeks did nothing to brighten our mood. We were all grieving in our own way and had our own struggles with why my dad, who was still relatively young, and still had so many gifts to share, had been taken from the earthly world. Some of us were angry with God. Others were just profoundly sad. To compound our grief, we had no form of transportation for us to get anywhere independently. My dad's van was not modified for me to drive yet, and my own car, my beloved Chevy Monte Carlo, died shortly after my dad died. Until my van, dad's van was modified, we had to rely on the goodness of friends to get the three of us to any medical appointments we had, as well as simple things, like getting groceries. It was a long 16 months until dad's van was modified for me to be able to drive. About five months after my dad died, I was met with one of my first challenges in the grief process. The handbook choir at St. Paul's UCC in Sacramento, 
with which my mom, my sister, and I had just started helping, was asked to play for a Sunday during Advent here at Salem. I was 30 years old at the time and hadn't been back to Salem in a little over 25 years, and this would be my first time back without my dad. So much time had passed, and so much had happened in those two and a half decades. My mind was filled with all kinds of questions. Would it be awkward? Would we feel welcome? Would anybody remember us? Would it be just too hard to be there without my dad? Don't ask me why I was so nervous, but I was. Sunday came, and I was still nervous. We arrived and came in through the side door at the ramp entrance. I opened the door, and grief smacked me in the face. I had forgotten that at the time, the pictures of all your previous pastors were hanging on the wall in the side room, right as you entered the room. And my dad's picture was the first thing that I saw. I immediately burst into tears. All the grief that I didn't realize that I was still holding in came flooding out. But you know what else happened? You welcomed us back. You had kind words of sympathy and made us feel like we belonged here. You have no idea what that meant to me and my family. As a PK, you see the good and bad in churches, even from a young age. You realize from a young age that you must always be on guard because, unfortunately, some people are not what they seem at first. Because of this, the church has not always felt like a welcoming place for me. So to feel welcome was a big deal. But in those moments, it was as if God took all my doubts and fears and erased them. For the first time in a long time, I felt at peace. And I continue to feel this way. And you know what else I realized? Maybe seeing that picture of my dad when I first came back here to Salem was God's way of telling me that everything would be okay and that he was watching over me. At least that's what I tell myself every time I've been here since that day. I mentioned feeling at peace. Peace is probably one of the hardest things to find, especially when things don't go as we think they should. It can take years, even decades, as evidence in this message. I've had my own journey of finding peace since January of 2023. A year and nine months ago today, I had one of the most difficult experiences of my life. On January 20th of 2023, I had my left foot and ankle amputated after dealing with a stubborn wound on my heel from a blister that wouldn't heal after months of treatment. I was privileged to share my faith journey through amputation back in January over at St. Paul's on the day after the year anniversary of my amputation. For the sake of time, I'll give you an abbreviated version along with an update from the last nine months. My faith journey through amputation has had its highs and lows. In the 11 days before my amputation, the longest 11 days of my life, I spent a lot of time in the hospital talking to that empty chair right next to me crying out to God for mercy, to take away my suffering and give me peace. Well, God didn't answer my prayer in the way that I had hoped. God did grant my wish. God was merciful, ended my suffering, and eventually allowed me to find peace with my amputation. You may say, but how? You ended up having a part of your body removed. And you're right, I did. However, God showed his mercy and ended my suffering by allowing me to live. Had I not had my amputation, there was a serious possibility of ending up getting sentenced and possibly dying. I didn't want to die, so the only other option was surgery. And God saw me through that surgery and allowed me to live. And he's given me the support system that I needed to get through the aftermath of my situation. I'd like to say that I've had complete peace since my amputation, but I'd be lying. Peace does not always come easily, and even today, I still struggle with being at peace with it, especially when things have not gone according to plan, at least my plan, or when progress is in slower than I would like. And it's not so much the physical loss of my life that I struggle with. I have made my peace with it. It's the loss of independence that I still struggle with. This has been particularly true in the last nine months. After my amputation and two weeks in inpatient rehabilitation, I was finally cleared to start the next step in my journey at the end of February of 2023, getting a prosthesis. 
What I thought would take a few weeks to accomplish ended up taking months. Due to several medical factors, having lymphedema and having spina bifida, in addition to my amputation, it took almost eight months and seeking a second opinion with another prosthetist for me to finally receive a prosthesis. But it finally happened at the end of September of 2023. I finally got my prosthesis and was able to stand for the first time in about seven years. I cried tears of joy. I could finally start inpatient prosthetic training. I started inpatient rehabilitation at the end of October of 2023. I was there for two weeks I was determined that I'd be able to start walking by the end of those two weeks. However, two weeks came and went. I still wasn't walking. I was only standing for brief periods of time at that point. It was a major slap in the face to my confidence. After all, I had seen so many other amputees get their prosthesis and start walking in much lesser time than I was experiencing. If they could do it, I could not. I had to learn not to compare my progress with the progress of others, especially with those who had never dealt with a physical disability prior to amputation. This was, and still is, easier said than done. However, since leaving inpatient rehab at the beginning of November of 2023 and starting outpatient physical therapy a few weeks later, I made major progress and was able to take my first steps on December 19th, just in time for Christmas. Again, just when I thought I was getting somewhere, I was thrown for another loop. By February of 2024, my progress in physical therapy seemed to slow down, and I was discharged from outpatient physical therapy. I had to start playing the insurance game and take a few months off until insurance would approve another round of therapy, which happened in May, and then was discontinued again by the end of June. Meanwhile, I was still fighting to get lymphedema therapy for my legs, to no avail. Again, insurance wouldn't pay for the supplies I needed to help decrease the swelling in my legs, and by the end of June, therapy was put on hold because my prosthesis wouldn't fit due to the increase in swelling. By this point, I was so frustrated and discouraged. I was trying my best in physical therapy, and I seemed to hit a brick wall. And I felt like I was being compared to my more able-bodied peers. No one seemed to understand the odds I was up against in order to learn how to walk again or just feel independent again. It had taken me a year to go from a standing frame to a walker and another year to go from a walker to crutches. And that was when I was a kid and had two full legs. I was trying to do it now as an adult with one leg partially amputated. Of course it was going slower than expected. And the lymphedema just created a denominal effect. Insurance wasn't paying for the wrappings I needed to treat the lymphedema. Therefore, my leg was too swollen, and my prosthesis wouldn't fit due to the lymphedema. And then I couldn't get physical therapy to run the walk again because my prosthesis wouldn't fit. I had worked so hard to make peace with my amputation, and for the most part, I had. It was a lack of independence I felt that literally kept me up at night. Peace had been hard to find, and still is sometimes. But through persistence and prayer, I'm happy to report that funds have finally been allocated to pay for the supplies that I need to work on my lymphedema. And once that is under control, I hope to get back into physical therapy to try to learn to walk again. While this has taken far longer than I ever imagined, I'm constantly reminded that all things happen in God's own time and in God's own way. You've probably heard the phrase, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. When I hear this, I jokingly retort back the words of Mother Teresa. I just wish God wouldn't trust me so much. But now, I like to think of that first phrase this way. God doesn't give us more than we can handle. God helps us handle what we are given. My journey's been long and hard, and I wouldn't be here today except by the grace of God. God has never left me and has been with me and helped me get through the struggles of the last year. And I've learned to find peace amongst the chaos of life. And I have found peace through your prayers and support. It is comforting to see the good that God is doing here at Salem. I see it in the seemingly small acts of kindness. I know that when I come here, I can be greeted by familiar and friendly faces who have been willing to help our family in several different ways. Whether it was providing transportation for my family in the months after my dad died, providing transportation to my mom and sister when I was in the hospital for my amputation, or simply helping my mom and me into the church building. So thank you 
for helping my family feel welcome again. It's meant a lot to us, and I know it would have meant 